Hello, I'm Michelle. And I'm Lucy. Welcome to Tudoriferous, the biographical podcast that examines lives in the Tudor era. And today... Bishop Fox Part 2. Ooh. Yeah, we sort of fizzled out at the end of the last one, but (laughs) it was... I had to cut it off somewhere, otherwise this one was going to be really, really obscenely long. Okay. We are now going to focus on Fox's in position. He's gone through all his training. He's met with Henry. They've won the Battle of Bosworth, and he has his first bishopric. And now we're into his nonstop body politic work. Right. And it was exhausting just to read. It's another one of those. (laughs) Is he actually doing this now? Because he seemed to have an awful lot of things last time that he didn't actually physically do. Those were all ecclesiastical. Right. So this is, again, quite a bit where he never actually goes to his diocese. But... Because he's too busy. He is too busy. I honestly don't know how he keeps going. We are starting in 1494 now. He is again immediately sent to Scotland to gain peace treaty and to separate James from... Can you guess? Diayela? No. Oh, no, Perkin. Yes, Perkin (laughs) Warbeck. He is now referred to as the Bishop of Durham. This is Fox. He has now again left Bath and Wells to a larger, more prosperous bishopric. So far, Fox had had a hand in or directly negotiated all treaties with every foreign country that they attempted. Mm. Not a clue how you manage that. Part of it is because they've got ambassadors coming to London, but he is also going to the Netherlands, France, Scotland, all over the place. And this is a man who barely eats as well. I mean, he's... (laughs) He's an aesthetic, yes. Mm. Yes, tiny. They never mention that he wears a hair shirt. He looks the type, though, doesn't he? Yes, he does. (laughs) He really does. And later on in episode three, you really start to think that, yes, he must have been wearing a hair shirt. (laughs) It appears that the Bishopric of Durham was fairly unique in England. The men that held this bishopric were often called Prince Bishops of the County Palatine of Durham. Oh, right. That's not a thing now, I'm pretty sure. I was going to ask you. I've not heard it, no. Okay. The bishops in Durham were put there by the king specifically. So this is another one of those times where England gets to decide who their bishops are. The only thing Mm. they have to get approval from, from the Pope is for cardinalships which isn't the same in other countries. And they were put there to manage the Scottish Marcher region. So we were talking about Thomas Stanley before doing the Marcher region of Wales and Mm. Scotland. This is the other half of that region. Right. Much like our previous subject, Thomas Stanley, this was a position of immense power. The bishop was allowed to raise troops without having to request permission from the king first. Didn't have to notify him. Something that Thomas Dan couldn't do. They could coin their own money. Really? Yes. They were also allowed to levy separate taxes and to fortify their defenses without consultation with the king. That's quite dangerous. You need to be very Very. careful about who you put in in that role, don't you? Yes. You have to trust them implicitly. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely insane. At least I thought it was insane for all of this, of you ensuring that the nobles had little bits of land everywhere without letting them have a main power base. This is somebody having a very strong power base. Hmm. They could also appoint coroners, justices of the peace, and have their own prisons. They were essentially a king within a kingdom. Mind you, uh, looking at Reginald Bray and looking at how they levied fines on people who let prisoners go, a lot of these people were priests. Were they? Who were being fined for letting prisoners go. So they presumably had their own prisons. Priests had their own prisons for clerical They did, yeah. Violations. Are you saying that they also held secular prisoners? It didn't specify that they were clerical prisoners, but then it did just say they they were fined for the escape of prisoners, so maybe they were clerics, yeah. I don't know. This specific uh, for Durham is specifically secular prisons. 
Hmm. Hmm. Oh, I don't know now. The other thing that this bishop was allowed to do was to meet with the Scots to make peace treaties independently of consultation with the king or the council. Oh. Yeah, very interesting, isn't it? Yeah. So the first the king would know about it was when he was informed it was done. Not necessarily. I'm seeing that in times of extreme strife, where there's a bunch of border raids coming through from Scotland, yes, it was after the treaty had already been made. But at other times, when it's you've got more play, less people are getting injured or hurt and less things are getting stolen, they would let the king know that they're going to make a treaty. It's not a peace treaty as in what we're thinking. It's more of a non-aggression pact. Right. Just just stop raiding. Yes. Yeah. But there are several dispatches going to kings previously, like to Edward the Fourth. I found one, where it says, we're running into this, I'm going to be offering this and this in order to get the treaty. And Edward just sent back, okay, basically. Hmm. So sometimes the king knew about it beforehand, sometimes they didn't. It all depended on how horrific the border raids were. It's probably just do what you have to do, I suppose, isn't it? Yes. And before mm. everybody starts flipping out, the English were doing border raids on Scotland, too. Oh, yeah. It was not just the Scots. <laughs> there was not one way, which is why they had to do the treaties, because the Scots would every once in a while be like, hey, this isn't this isn't right. Yeah. No, it's not odd how people can't see that doing something to somebody else means that when they do it to you, you can't then stamp <laughs> your foot and say this isn't fair. Yes. <laughs> Hypocrite! (laughs) (laughs) Because of the strategic importance of Durham and how dangerous it was, this is the first time Fox must go to his diocese. He needs to be on hand in order to action anything. You don't have that luxury of a time frame of send somebody and let them ride for seven days to get down to London get some sort of answer from a council that has to meet and argue for a while Mm. and then send back your decision. And you have to get everyone together to sit on the council. for Yes. So that might take some time. Yeah. So Durham also had its own council. But we will find, or I'll just say it now, Bishop Fox quite often will make decisions without using the council. Hmm. Okay. The decisions aren't bad, though. He is surprisingly gentle. All through his history, all I see is how gentle he is. It's really... Well, you'd like to think that went with being a bishop, but it really but doesn't. It didn't. <laughs> no. When I first started reading about him, and I got about halfway through the first book, and I realized I started getting almost tense. When is this going to turn into a bishop, <laughs> vicious man, the vicious bishop? Try saying that seven times fast. <laughs> It never happened. We've got a nice person. We actually have another nice person. Well, that's two. Leonardo da Vinci. (laughs) That's it. (laughs) Oh, does he free birds from the market as well? (laughs) No, but for humans, we will see a bunch of things coming up later that you'll see that he had the option of doing some really nasty things and actually fought against it. Hmm. Oh. Oh, yeah. Enjoy this one. So Fox is in Durham now. He is actually physically in that location because it requires him to be there. It allowed him for the first time to take on his actual ecclesiastical duties as well. Because now he's there. He doesn't have to hand it off to somebody else because he's physically present. It shouldn't be a chore to go to Durham. Durham is an exceptionally lovely place. Is it? (laughs) Yes. Well, now it's exceptionally lovely, and it probably was then. But if you start hearing screaming in the distance, it doesn't Mm. stay lovely very long. Yeah, I didn't hear screaming when I was there. (laughs) (laughs) Thankfully. (laughs) He starts taking on duties himself. Actually, sorry, I butt butt again. I've just had a thought. The villages around Durham are made, are built in such a way that there is one way in and one way out. For defence. For defence. And they're yeah. still, you they're can still, still like see that? that, yes. Huh. Yeah, which is not yeah. great for traffic control, but it's... No. <laughs> it's great if you're uh, getting raided by the Scots. Yes. And whatever German mercenaries they happen to have on hand. Mm. <laughs> 
the ones that Maximilian could spare. <laughs> <laughs> Fox started doing things himself. So he completed visitations. If you remember from the first one, visitations are actually investigations into abuses. Mm. Absenteeism, which I thought was kind of hypocritical. <laughs> He was reforming churches and monasteries under his authority. He even petitioned Henry to have some women accused of heresy arrested for not appearing before his court. The women had been excommunicated earlier that year. And this is our first mention of the Lollard Uprising. That's all. I was just reading about the Lollards today, and it said that they were not such a big thing as is sometimes made out. So. No, because they kept getting stamped out. And this is really mm. before the printing press would make their English Bible easily spreadable. Mm. So they were easier to, shall we say, remove. Mm. To quieten. Yes. Yeah. When I say he's gentle here... Yeah, that didn't sound gentle. <laughs> it is and it isn't. Heresy at this time in England was a burnable offense. You don't hear him doing that. He would issue penances that were publicly humiliating, but not physically damaging, which is interesting. Mm. He had a lot of really nasty things he could have put in place for their punishment, and he didn't. And all of them had a chance, were provided the opportunity to return to the church, which in sub... So it's the ones that didn't get hanged? <sighs> no. Huh. He just expelled them from his diocese. Ah. But again, you're not dead. Not unless the diocese you have to go into has considerably more yes. hawkish bishop, I suppose. At the same time, I did find records of some of the people that he did. Not very many got expelled from his diocese. And those that did ended up returning to the church in the new diocese. When you get to the point in Tudor England, which carried on up until 1920s or so, if you moved from one place to another, you brought with you letters of recommendation mm. to tell people that you were trustworthy, what kind of skills you brought, basically a character reference. When you're excommunicated and expelled from a diocese, you come without those letters of reference. Your life is going to be extremely difficult until you mm. rebuild that trust in your new home. You won't be able to do that if you remain excommunicated from a church. You have to do your penance at that point or you won't survive. Mm. And those people, I did not find any accounts of them recommitting the heresy offense. Either, which is horrible, either they quietly died or mm. they still re-entered the church and then never brought that up again. But it's mm. still a gentler approach than some of the other bishops who were doing massive public floggings where mm. they remove the skin from the person's back. Like I got some pretty disturbing punishments for her heresy from some of the other bishoprics. Heresy is always there's just heresy and treason, isn't it? Suddenly yes. the the viciousness cranks up. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. At the same time, this is a time period when 15 was the allowable age for execution. Mm. Right. Ugh. Fox first begins his major forays into his other passion of architecture here. Again, when do you have the time? <laughs> he renovated Durham's castle's Great Hall. It's here that we see the first use of his emblem of the ballooning pelican being stamped in stone with his motto, by the grace of God. This makes sense. He's a bishop. Wouldn't that be mm -hmm. a good motto? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it seems to make a lot more sense than most of them. Yes. <laughs> Jane, I keep thinking of Jane Seymour's, bound to serve and obey. Oof. Come on, give me a better one. Or was that just yes. to keep your head so Henry wouldn't kill you? <laughs> I don't know. Commodores are not entitled to emblems or coats of arms, so we know now that he is considered in the nobility. Because well, I suppose if you're a prince. Yes, and you're a bishop. So, Bishops technically can get this, but they still have to apply to be allowed to have a motto and an emblem. 
Right, because bishops can still, well, still now sit in the House of Lords. So they are an honorary noble. Yes, but... And so there's still quite a lot of fuss about it. Why are bishops sitting in the House of Lords? <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming because at this point they are landholders. In Tudor England, he now, moving to Durham especially, he has a massive amount of land. He has castles, he has estates, he has, well, he has many mills. Mm -hmm. So he is technically a lord, and people do owe fealty to him. So it makes mm -hmm. sense that they would be the House of Lords. Mm -hmm. What I found interesting is that even though you are a bishop, you still have to apply to the heralds in order to be allowed to create your emblem and your motto. And they have to approve that emblem and motto as well. You don't just get to pick it. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's for everybody, though, isn't it? With your mm -hmm. nobles and, yeah, if you use it without permission, they'll yes. come and take it down again. Yes. And you get fined. Hmm? While Fox is taking on more and more Episcopal duties, he in no way reduced his secular ones. He was incessantly busy. Not constantly, incessantly. Mm -hmm. I'm not entirely sure where he got time to sleep. If he's an ascetic, he probably didn't sleeps very little, I should think, didn't he? That'd be all part of it. Hmm. He made his own coinage. He designed it and had it struck. They are called Durham pennies with R.D. on them for Ricardus Dunolomensis Episcopus, showing his bishopric. Hmm. Hmm. He attacked the lawlessness that had been plaguing Durham. The bishop who he took it from had passed away, and he was elderly at the time and apparently quite ineffectual in his later days. So lawlessness, not just from the Scots raiding, but from the people in Durham creating bands and attacking English as well as Scottish, they were just attacking everybody, was quite a problem. He used the double stick of secular trials and clerical trials. So he was going after them both through the law of the court and through excommunications. Hmm. Although he did say, and this was one part where he cringed, I won't go after you if you just stop attacking the English. Okay, so that implies that there's something else they could be doing. The Scots. Yeah. I really, really struggled with this until I realized he had been trying to get a treaty with Scotland, a non-aggression pact for this area, and they were refusing to come to the table. Mm. So by doubling up the banditry up on the Scottish side might bring them to the table to negotiate. But at the same time, you're going after women, children, villagers, their cows. Yeah. And you're letting it happen. It's not a battle. Raids aren't battle. Battles are no. between two lots of soldiers. Raids that are have civilians. are aware of what it's going to happen. This is civilians and the children mm. especially. Mm. His actions did work for the English side of the border. And it did bring the Scots to the table. Well. Yeah. All sorted. He had started the reconciliation. He wasn't able to complete it because he was recalled to London. And this is where we loop in with Burgundy to repair the trade relationship with Flanders. He was the lead in the Intercursus Magnus Treaty. All right. So you're mm. halfway through this. You're going to leave somebody else in charge. You've got to come down to London because we are now running out of money because we can't trade. And there was nobody else who could do this? There were other people, but mm. he seemed to lead most of these diplomatic missions. Mm. I'm not so he must have been fantastic at it. Yeah. Then he was sent back to Berwick upon Tweed to head an army to defend against a Scottish invasion. So the people he left in charge didn't do anything. <laughs> they were <laughs> unsuccessful. They probably did a lot, but it was ultimately unsuccessful. But he actually donned armor and led the army a battling bishop they were required to multitask at a tremendous rate weren't they at that time don't they i mean can you imagine no i'm trying to think i can't remember the name of the... i can't remember the name of the archbishop now but i just yeah our, our archbishop of durham whoever he might be um 
Yes. That's what he does, I think. I don't think he does. <laughs> he does all these other things. You're a bishop. You're supposed to be peaceful. Mm, well, I think we've left that one behind, haven't we? <laughs> if, if we have here. <laughs> they were successful in pushing back that invasion. Quite successful. He had now proven himself as a military leader. Weird. And then he was sent directly into Scotland to open up treaty negotiation with James. Then he was pulled back to London to be part of the council. So he was in Windsor with the king when later a Scottish army again invaded Northumberland in 1496. So it's back and forth. Scotland, London, Scotland, London, Scotland, London. Yeah, it's a hell of a trick. <laughs> Nonstop. <laughs> in four years, I think he made 11 trips. Grief. Yeah. Constant, constant move. The tensions between Scotland and England just continued to escalate. This forced Fox to order better defenses, provisions to be accumulated in Durham so that they could survive a siege if it happened. He also called up a garrison, all while trying to convince James IV to expel Warbeck. While he was at Norham Castle, he was physically besieged by the Scots while he was still trying to make peace. Mm. He, unlike others, refused to leave and remained with the soldiers to ensure the defense of the castle. Hmm. And he was given the opportunity to leave because he was a bishop. By the Scots? By the Scots. Hmm. And he said no. Richard just showed the entire country that the king had placed him in the correct position, that he could ses successfully be a military leader as well as already showing that he could be a successful civil leader. And now with him in Durham and the reforms that he was making being successful, he was also showing that ecclesiastically he could do the job as well. And he did so well that the Scots actually had to retreat. They had to leave. Really? What was he doing to them then? That's not normal for, for besiegers, he, is it? No, but he had managed to get the defenses together, actual military supplies, so they could attack back instead of just sitting in the castle waiting for the next attack. So he yeah, beat right. them back from the inside. Mm. We've seen it works. We saw with um, our Patreon episode about <laughs> Katerina Sforza. Yes. That her, t her technique was to let them freeze out there, wasn't it? Yes. While they pretended to be having a big party inside. <laughs> Yeah, psychological warfare. Mm. Yeah. Oh, and I, depending I on what she's... time of year it is, it's if they're up in Northumberland, it's going to be a tad nippy if it's in the winter. Yeah. I know she's not a nice person, but I really enjoyed her. <laughs> yes. Feisty. Oh, yes. She, yeah, she had a, a, a story to tell, definitely. Fox was again called on to attempt a treaty with the Scots. He'd now beaten them back. These talks were led by Bishop William Elphinstone, who Fox accompanied along with William Warham. Here we have proof that Fox and Pedro de Ayala met. Ah. Yeah. Pedro. It's always nice when our people, people cross, you know, find, find themselves in the same place. In my head I hear, oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> hello. <laughs> Pedro was acting as mediator. Instead of a lasting peace, all they managed was a truce. But since there hadn't been a truce for quite a while, that's still quite an accomplishment. They're two very different people, aren't they? It'd, be, it'd make a good uh, sitcom, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes, it would. You've got the bishop all austere, and then you've got Dayella with a woman across his lap, <laughs> drinking, throwing things at the walls. <laughs> he did what to his rooms? <laughs> Yes, and Bishop Fox sitting there with a completely stony face from time to time, <laughs> scratching as his hair shirt hurts. But yeah, oh, I yeah. can see that. Oh, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall when they met. Hello, how are you? <laughs> fine. Yes. <laughs> I'm as fine as God expects me to be. <laughs> In 1498, as part of the attempts to calm the border through talks, Scottish gentlemen came to Norham to share drinks with the garrison. This sounds okay. <laughs> I wonder whose idea that was. <laughs> I'm not sure. I didn't find out whose idea it was. 
We don't know exactly what started the fighting, but it ended oh. with the death of several of the Scotsmen. It's probably the alcohol started the fighting. <laughs> that, was, that was where their problem started. <laughs> Somebody might have made a not so nice remark. <laughs> King James was enraged at this violation of their newly signed treaty. Fox took charge and personally met with King James to quell the tensions from the quote-unquote accident. (laughs) Mm. Everybody, in all the documents, it was an accident. No, it was a riot and a brawl, (laughs) but it was an accident. It went so well that King James and Fox began broaching a permanent peace between England and Scotland through a possible marriage to Margaret Tudor. Oh, yep, it's been... A little mite. <laughs> it's been broached. The trust they developed between them led to Fox arranging the future marriage treaty that did result in the wedding in 1502. Poor Margaret. Hmm. Poor, poor Margaret. <laughs> oh, well, we haven't done it yet. We might find that she loved every minute of it. Who knows? <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't laugh like that. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Ah, I don't think so. 1499, Fox put another passion into play that would encompass much of his life, the education of others. Hmm. This was not just a passion, it became an obsession for him. He was elected Chancellor of Cambridge University for 1500 to 1501. Throughout this period, we find that Fox was seeking out or being sought out by men that would rise high both in church and in court. Here is where we see his protégés begin their rise. Prior to this, I think he was just too busy to deal with somebody Mm -hmm. else's ambitions and abilities. Now we see them just being thrown into the mix constantly. John Fisher, we did speak about him during Margaret Beaufort's effort episode. You did? She was, he was her confessor, I think. Yes, yes. Yeah. John Fisher recommended Fox for the chancellorship through them applying to Margaret Beaufort for who she wanted. Fisher had been a few years earlier the spiritual advisor of Margaret Beaufort, so he had met Fox and decided he would be perfect. Fox, in turn, recommended Fisher for the same post after his own term was up. And this may seem strange, but Fisher was not technically qualified for that position. So he couldn't have said, I will take it. So he put in Fox and Fox, in turn, basically boosted him up and said, yes, you know what? He's going to be the man for you. So while it sounds like Fisher was the one pushing up Fox, it's actually the other way around. It sounds a bit like you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours, though. Very much so. (laughs) Very, very much so. Fox then also ensured Fisher received the See of Rochester in 1503 or 1504. It's hard to say exactly when that happened. Fox also brought William Warham through the ranks as the Dean of Wells Cathedral when Fox was bishop there, as well as an emissary at court. It's it's actually a little hard to say if Fox was the one bringing the emissary work to Warham, but the appointment of Dean was certainly given to him by Fox. Warham is important, and I hope we have him in our box. Do we? No, I don't think we do. Okay, we're going to have to put him in our box. Because okay. Warham would go on to surpass Fox by becoming... I should the... imagine it's Warham, by the way. Warham. We don't usually say, <laughs> okay. say, Warham. say the ham. No ham. <laughs> Warham would go on to surpass Fox by becoming the Archbishop of Canterbury. Yeah, the top dog. Yes, he was very active in court. Fox has been quoted later in life when he was Bishop of Winchester as not being bothered by the fact that Warham became the Archbishop because, quote, Canterbury had a higher seat, but Winchester was more succulent, end quote. Succulent? It was richer, (laughs) much, much richer. Whether he believed his own words, we don't really know. The two men would very much fall out later over Episcopal rights. His possibly most famous protege, can you guess? Woolsey? Yeah. (laughs) Thomas Woolsey. Woolsey comes into Fox's story at exactly this time. He entered the service of the Bishop of Durham. 
In this particular case, it appears that Woolsey sought out an appointment with Fox rather than Fox discovering him. Some historians take a strong stand that if Fox had not promoted the cause of these men, the Tudor age would not have been nearly as important for history. These men make some very strong changes in the way the government ran and the way the church ran. But you get the impression with Woolsey, he'd have made it somehow, wouldn't he? Yeah. We haven't done him yet, but he feels like the clawing kind of person. You stick him in a pit and he will claw his way out. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, he must have been extremely good at what he did. Yes. But yes, he certainly yes. made sure that he got it, got everything that he was entitled to, didn't he? Yes. Anyway, next season for him. But... Yes. <laughs> he has to wait. <laughs> Historian Clayton Drees goes on as far to state that through his own actions in the promotion of these men, Fox is the quote unquote architect of the Tudor age. But I believe you said you're getting the same thing for Reginald Bray? Um, no, I was getting the fact that literally an architect, whereas ah. in the 19th century, he was described as, and some some of the things I've come across say, Reginald Bray, architect. I think actually, oh. actually, no, that was sort of quite a long way down his list of achievements. Oh. And it's hard to tell how much you're an architect and how much you've just put in, you know, your opinions about what it should look like. Right. So I don't think he's, I don't know if he's these people who said to be architects, actually sit down with plans and draw them out. And I don't know. Maybe mm. they had a different definition of architect? Mm. Possible? Site manager or something, yeah. Mm -hmm. Fox was more the architect of how the Tudors went because of all mm. these men that end mm. up being so prominent. Just like many of the other prominent men, Fox was also called upon to settle disputes, both legal and personal. Again, where on earth do they find the time for all of this? Uh, historian Drees, I love this comment, quote, giving him little peace but ample opportunity to demonstrate his well-developed time management and administrative skills, end quote. <laughs> I was just thinking about the Tudor way of sleeping. You know, you have your first sleep, then you wake oh, up, yes. and then you have your second sleep. Maybe that's, that frees up loads of time to get things done. I don't know, to be because doing nobody else now. is awake? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I honestly have no idea how they do this. While all of this was going on, Richard also added author to his occupations. <laughs> he wrote, quote, Contemplation of Sinners, end quote. That's the title. That was then printed by Winken de Word. I love that he's in there. <laughs> in 1500, Fox was given the quote-unquote honor, remember how we were talking about how honors always seem to be more work, <laughs> of arranging Catherine's progress and route to London when she arrived to marry Arthur. <laughs> all right. Yes. All honors are work. All of it. Yeah. He was also given another singular honor of mm. baptizing Prince Edmund when he was born. Then later, at Edmund's christening, he was made Edmund's godfather and spiritual guardian. At this time, this is the same as bringing Fox literally into the family. Yeah, I suppose it is, yeah. Yes, he is now technically the brother to the king and queen as the godfather of the Prince Edmund. Edmund, unfortunately, did not survive very long after no. that. In 1501, Fox was translated to his final see as Bishop of Winchester. I love how they say translated instead of just transferred. Yeah, translated is something you do with the, the bodies of saints. Yes. I, I, think that, I think I've got that right, isn't it? When you move them to a different grave, yes. I think they get translated. Yes. At mm. least that's what I remember. Mm. Watch, we're both wrong. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we'll look it up and edit it out if it's wrong. <laughs> yes. I'm not sure if he only did this because it was the richest diocese in England or if it was because he needed to be closer to London <laughs> for all yeah, the trips. Yeah, I, I should think the commute must have been hell <laughs> coming down from Durham. Is it the richest one because it's associated with the royals as well? Sort of. It has the most estates and property. Right. A mm. lot of it. And not just estates and property, it also had a hospital. Hmm? One of the only dioceses to have an actually an actual functioning hospital. 
Most monasteries would care for the sick. This is a dedicated building that all it did was be a hospital for the poor. Hmm. And not so poor. Handy. He now had an annual salary of 3,691 pounds per year as the bishop. That's... Wow. Yeah, a lot of money. That's a lot of, lot, of, lot, of, lot of money. That really is. In addition to the income from his court positions and duties, mm. he is a very, very wealthy man. Very wealthy ascetic, isn't he? <laughs> yes. Start eating. Yes. <laughs> Just have a cake. Uh, yum. <laughs> <laughs> the position came with 16 manors, many estates, and a large house in London, as well as that hospital we mentioned. I really think that location must have been one of the main benefits of this. He is getting older. This diocese is close to court and had a house in London that he could live in rather than being at the court itself, which is a little quieter. There would be much less travel in his day-to-day -day duties. He's already different but from himself in that he would no longer place surrogates in place to do his work for the church. He didn't want to do that. He was going to be able to do it himself. And since he doesn't have to travel as far, he has a better chance of actually accomplishing this. Hmm. He did still appoint men to help him because it was a lot of work. But he was never going to be an absent bishop again. Just wasn't going to happen. I suppose, I suppose um, Winchester is also the much easier job because the Scots don't attack Winchester, do they? <laughs> Very true. <laughs> You're not having to don armor and get no. an army together and find all the supplies. That's For people who don't know, don't know about English geography, Winchester's very much down south. <laughs> <laughs> Far away from either the border of the Wales marches mm. or the Scottish marches. The men he did appoint to help him would take his place if he was away on royal business, but when he was in town, he was doing the duties. In 1502, he was already active in reforms of his new diocese, investigating, quote, dilapidated church fabric at several parishes, end quote. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're frowning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I ended up speaking with Bree from Pontifax about this, and it was... Funny us going back and forth because we're like, fabric was very costly. They have all the altar cloths. They have buntings and everything. Oh, no, they mean the stone. It's the stone. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. Yeah. So fabric, when you're doing masonry, once the stone is there with the cement holding it together, it's called fabric. Yeah. I didn't know that. It's not <laughs> right. a term used in Canada at all. Well, yeah, it's, it's not some. Yeah, I think if you talk about the fabric of the church, yeah, I would assume the building as a whole. Yeah, didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was very much a side <laughs> research thing with us going, what is this? I don't know. <laughs> well, luckily, luckily I'm here to translate them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, cloth was ridiculously expensive, but mm. I couldn't imagine why you needed to investigate the fact that it was dilapidated. <laughs> it gets used. It breaks down. So yeah, it, it, it actually is the actual buildings. <laughs> mm. So they've been fix fixing these things forever. I suppose you've got some churches that are probably 12th century and, and before, haven't you, that yes. they will be knackered by now. Mm. Yes, they were falling apart. We've got concrete cracks, leaks, broken windows, all of that. Fox was fixing all of that. He was also acting against abuses he found within the churches. The absences make me feel a little weird because he wasn't there for his first few seas and he was ordering parish priests to go back to their areas and actually be a priest on site whereas he wasn't doing that earlier yeah but what were they doing when they weren't on site don't know I mean, yeah because when he he was busy we know what he was doing yes <laughs> yes whereas presumably they were just putting their feet up somewhere yes i don't know mm. what they were doing there was also lax discipline and some rather scandalous behavior he found in this diocese that would make the bishop begin his work on monastic and convent reform that he became famous across Europe for. He would... Okay, we're going to discuss this for Allie. Allie, Rex Factor, <laughs> this is your scandal. He would be going after a wide variety of excesses and abuses 
his men found heresy in convents and monasteries, which was surprising. <gasps> yeah. Laxity, not following the rules if you have a vow of silence and everybody's chattering away. Corruption, mm -hmm. ignorance. There were quite a few monks and nuns that couldn't even read the Bible in Latin. Well, they probably didn't all want to be there, did they? I mean, some no. of them had been dumped there. As a so, younger son. Yeah. Yeah. Licentious behavior, Allie. <laughs> <laughs> Women were being invited into the monasteries and men into the convents. Right. I think we're on to <laughs> sex with nuns. Sex with nuns. <laughs> we got there. And sex <laughs> with monks. We should just say, for people who don't listen to Rex Factor, this is not an obsession of ours. No. <laughs> no, it's Ali's obsession. He gets a good <laughs> kick out of this. <laughs> the men and women were, in some cases, living in mortal sin <laughs> with these right. nuns or, or with the monks. You can see why people seem to be desperate for reform, <laughs> can't you? Yeah. Mm. Drunkenness, hunting, which was not allowed, apparently. Excessive drinking. So there's drunkenness and then there's excessive drinking. They're mentioned as two separate items in here. Right. <laughs> well, they, they, yeah, well, I suppose they all, even now, you get monasteries that brew certain yes. um, alcohol, certain beers or, what do you call it, uh, spirits. Yes, but so, where's the line between drunkenness and excessive drinking? Hmm. I suppose once you're drunk and you still carry on. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got gambling. It sounds like all the movies of college comedies mm. that were popular in the 80s and 90s. Yes, this has sort of got a montage feel about it now, yes. isn't it? But I love the image of the nuns. They were found to be visiting taverns. <laughs> These are supposed to be cloistered nuns. You're not only not only are you not supposed to be leaving unless you're doing charity work. You're going to a tavern and getting drunk. Did they have to put a cloak or something over their their habit so that people didn't know, or did people just say, "Oh, it's the nuns"? I'm assuming yes. people just said, "Oh, it's the nuns" because they were found out. Yeah. One abbess was suspected of improper relations with multiple men. Another abbess was instructed to stop eating and drinking to, quote, enormous excess, especially at night, end quote. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> she was also ordered to, quote, stop entertaining men, <laughs> end quote. Especially Not man. at night. <laughs> men, yes, especially at night. Her, she was so bad that her nuns were actually ordered to stay away from her chambers in the evening and at night. Oh, right, because she was busy. Yeah. <laughs> Fox had to investigate a group of suspected witches. I couldn't find the outcome other than I know that none of them were burned. It's really frustrating. So often you find with these investigations and, and court cases and things, you just don't hear the end. Yes. It's like having a who done it, and it just stops in... Yes. Yeah, 10 pages before the end. Yes. In this particular case, I know it's because the church caught fire and the records were destroyed. Right. So because it's ecclesiastic, the church records were there for these, these trials. Uh, the Lollards were also a thorn in his side in Winchester again. So he previously got them out of Durham. Now he's in Winchester. We haven't mentioned. They're actually a Protestant reform movement to mm. read English Bible so that they knew what the church was actually doing. Yeah, we were talking about doing a special episode on, on it. But, we yeah. probably should. <laughs> we yep. now have reasons why they might want to do some yeah. reform. <laughs> he forced them to recant and do penance or be excommunicated. No one was burned at this point. In the 1500s, we are now... In his records, full of royal council meetings, progresses with the kings, visits to both the continent and Scotland for diplomatic missions. He is, we're back to Edward Poynings, with popping mm. back and forth over the channel. Fox was also instrumental in keeping an alliance with Spain alive when Arthur died, being directly involved with the Spanish ambas ambassador, Dr. de Puebla. Actually, I'm just thinking, I'm trying to think about the research I've done so far on Reginald Bray. I'm not sure he does go abroad. Bray? He's, he's, yeah. 
Oh, am I, am I mis- I might be misremembering, but he's. I certainly um, got this feeling that he's popping over to the continent the whole time. Yeah, perhaps <laughs> fox. Perhaps fox has better sea legs than prey has. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> He was also present when Prince Henry formally protested the match to Catherine. Yes. 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 We haven't put that episode out yet, but we've recorded it about um, how Catherine has been treated. Yes. We should probably put that out before we put this one out, maybe. Or no, when is that one going out? I don't know. We're just, they're just stacking up now. <laughs> <laughs> we will put it out eventually. Yeah. I think we should put that one out quite soon because we recorded it ages ago. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. That episode where we discuss it is coming soon. Mm-hmm. And then we see the ridiculous with the serious. Fox in 1504 was commissioned with now Archbishop Warham to work to have King Henry VI canonized. Uh... <laughs> what? <laughs> Henry the Sixth was not a saint. <laughs> no, and it does seem really bizarre because I suppose, yeah, I suppose in the time frame we are now, it probably doesn't matter. But a lot of Henry the Seventh's people that came over to, to France to be with him were Edward's men. Yes, not Henry. Henry the no. Sixth is. <laughs> so that does seem an extraordinary thing to do. Yes, and isn't it kind of a slap in the face to your wife? Mm. Elizabeth of York, mm. saying that her father well, went against a saint. She she must have been dead by now, isn't she? What year are we in? Oh, yeah, she is. Mm. But this is not the first one. This is just the first one he was involved with. Pope Julius, of course, said no. Oh, well done, Julius. It's the first saint thing I've heard him do. <laughs> <laughs> As I just mentioned, it was attempted twice before with both Pope Innocent the Eighth and Alexander the Sixth, and all of them said no. <laughs> Fox, I don't think, actually pushed too hard because he apparently agreed with the papal decision. <laughs> Why are they so keen to it should go through? I have no idea. It's been a long, long time since they've had an English saint. Maybe they were just hoping Why for an English that saint. One? I, I mean, don't I, know. I have every sympathy with the poor bloke, but. I didn't see him as saintly material. Not at all. Hmm. We're going to go back to the universities here, because this is where the obsession really takes hold. When Oxford's Magdalen College fell... Hmm. Maudlin. <laughs> Maudlin. When Oxford's Maudlin College fell into disrepute due to poor discipline, Fox was called in to reform it. Fellows and scholars alike were drinking, gambling, poaching... Skipping lectures. They weren't even attending. I thought you were saying skipping. <laughs> no, and this is the people who are supposed to be teaching are skipping the lectures as well. Oh, right. <laughs> That's the thing. It's the, it's the usual of what you'd hear when you've got a y- bunch of 20-year-old boys. Mm. Sorry, I'm older than you. I can say boys. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Going off the rails in university, except the teachers are doing the same thing. <laughs> Two notations in the investigation were different from now. First, the students were we- coming wearing arms, blades, swords. But... Yeah, I don't think you get that in Oxford. <laughs> not now. <laughs> not now. A horror of horror. They were conversing in English, not Latin. Oh. How oh. dare you? How common of you? No, you've gone, it's gone too far now. It's yes. gone too far. Yes. Burn it down. <laughs> <laughs> the current president was himself a bishop. But the vice president of the college complained to Fox. By 1507, Fox had restored order by removing the president and sending his own man, Vicar General John Dowman, to fix the problems. Once order was restored, Fox put up John Claymond for president and he was elected. Claymond is another of Fox's protégés. Hmm. At the same time as he and Claymond were reforming Magdalen College, Fox was also knee-deep in revising the statutes of Balliol College. These are the rules and laws basically governing a college. This would turn out to be important later, so I wanted to mention it here. We will come back to this. Balliol was having the same issues as Magdalen College, but the source was deemed to be the medieval statutes or laws and regulations that were no longer up to par. The fellows applied to Pope Julius to have them reformed. Hmm. Apparently, it was a religiously based 
college, so the Pope would have ultimate authority. All right. But I couldn't find exactly why they went to the Pope instead of, say, the Cardinal of England. One of the archbishops. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe they didn't think that that particular person... They should... There's a, there is a hierarchy you have to follow, isn't there, with these with things? And yes. You have to go to the right person. But I suppose if, if you think the right person isn't up to the job, you might just as jump over them and go... That's a lot of people to, to the jump highest over. Authority. It is a lot. It's a big jump, <laughs> yes. Go right to the top. <laughs> boing, boing. <laughs> <laughs> The original statutes were based on medieval monastic rules. The Pope does. Well, we know what know what's going on in the monasteries. <laughs> yeah, it all and look, much it's the doing same. the same thing at the college. Yeah. <laughs> the Pope decided to appoint Fox and the Bishop of Carlisle to redo them. The Bishop of Carlisle then died, <laughs> almost almost a few days into the project. So Fox did them on his own. He didn't bother bringing anybody else in. It soon became apparent to Fox that revising them wouldn't work, so he scrapped them entirely and rewrote them from the ground up. What's really cool is there are still eight copies of these statutes in existence. We still have. And is that the statute that they use now? I'm assuming it's been redone a few times. Mm. You can't really keep Mm. the rules from. The 1500s yeah. and apply them now. I mean, I for don't know, one we're thing, we're talking about Oxford here. It's quite, it's quite possible. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you still can't beat students, though. No, you can't. You can't beat flog students, them. No. no, no, no. He then sent Claimant to secure the oaths to the new statutes. If you're interested, Balliol College has a fantastic archives page. One of the admitting papers may have even been penned by Fox. You can Ooh. see his handwriting, and it's on the web, so anybody can find it. Really cool. Really, really cool. <laughs> we will leave education here, but I do want to stress that his involvement in Balliol, Maudlin, and Pembroke Colleges, I didn't really go into the major detail with Pembroke College. It wasn't critical. will continue all the way up until 1518 when he finally resigned the mastership of Pembroke College. He was heavily involved in all of these colleges, both in patronage as well as visitations and reformations. We are nearing the end of Henry VII's life now. And this is reflected in Fox's own work. He was the head of the commission that was to hear and settle the claims against the government from the works of Empson and Dudley. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. He was also required to ensure any outstanding loans were paid. Always be solvent. Always be solvent, (laughs) Henry VII. These particular years were full of constant service specifically to Henry and travel with very, very, very little rest. It is noted for his images that we're talking about how pale and thin he was. It is noted that during this time he begins to look more gaunt and people were concerned for his health. Mm. So the yeah, less certainly the painting he he doesn't look except this isn't when the painting was taken, <laughs> <laughs> which makes you think, oh God, how did you look skeletal? Mm. <laughs> this will be interesting to you, Lucy. We had the Henry and Love episode, mm-hmm. and I have something we haven't mentioned before. Apparently, Fox was instrumental in the secret Treaty of Windsor where Henry agreed to support Philip's claim to the throne of Castile over Ferdinand. Right. And in return, Mm -hmm. Philip was giving Henry Philip's sister, Margaret Savoy, for his wife, regardless of her desires. Would you want to be in that situation? This woman no. being dragged, kicking and screaming. She's already said no, even though yeah. you had your little fingers out in your portrait. <laughs> Philip died before they could follow through with the treaty. Mm. And Margaret was like, Phew, that was close. <laughs> yeah, at least dad gave her the choice. <laughs> yes, Philip didn't. Philip no. did not. What a jerk. I think Maximilian comes across as a considerably nicer person than Philip. I'm not saying he was a yes. nice person. I'm just saying he was considerably nicer than Philip. Yes. Even then, mm. not... Neither one of them were very nice. No. No. 
Fox was not yet done attempting to arrange foreign marriages. His entire life was focused on keeping the peace. He really was one of those people pushing for peace rather than war. 1507 found him in the Netherlands attempting to arrange a marriage alliance between Mary Tudor and Charles of Austria, the eventual Mm -hmm. king of Spain. So she was possibly going to be the wife of the king of Spain, possibly the wife of, well, she ended up the wife of the king of France. Mm. This also did not come to fruition. They got all the way to completing a proxy wedding, which I didn't yeah. know about. Yeah, they did. Yeah. Yeah. But it fell through when Henry died in 1509. Yeah. Oh. We're going to stop there because now we're into the reign of Henry VIII. And life is going to be very, very different for Fox. He, yeah, I'm just remembering it was him who met with... Um, the Spanish ambassador that came after De Puebla, whose name now escapes me, and the ambassador oh, made... Shoot. Yes, the, amb- the ambassador really was so haughty and smug yes. that everybody that they were they just said, sort yourself out, we're not going to talk to you. Even Catherine mm. couldn't stand him. And then the next time he arrived, Fox said, yeah, take her. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they're going to get married. And he almost sort of fell over. <laughs> Hang on a minute, did I do that? <laughs> we will pick fox's story up again with the reign of henry the eighth and he's going to go quite far into the reign of henry the eighth he's a very old man isn't he he is a very old man yes you don't have to eat too much (laughs) (laughs) very true (laughs) very true maybe that's the maybe that's the secret Mm. eat very little sleep very little and you'll live forever. And you'll live forever. Thatcher didn't sleep. Oof. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we will see you next time. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>